On behalf of Pastor Joe L. Newsom and First Lady Annette Newsom, welcome to Be Ye Holy Ministries. In my soul, he is a wonder, hallelujah. In my For your throne of grace, I'm now supper before thee once again in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I come now asking that you forgive me, Lord, of any sins I may have committed. Sins of omission, sins of commission, sins of ignorance, and then those presumptive willful sins. Lord, I come now asking that you forgive me in the name of Jesus. Let me not stand before these thy people in hypocrisy, but search my heart my mind and my soul, anything that's not like you, God, you take it out and take control right now. That the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart may be acceptable to thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And all God's people say, amen and amen. Truly, I want to thank God once again for being here with you on another glorious day, for this is the day the Lord has made and I will continue to rejoice and be glad in it to those that are protesting amen uh, on behalf of that the injustice that's being done in the land i want you to know that we have not a high priest that have not been touched with the feelings of our infirmities so just want to encourage you that we do have a savior that identifies and sympathizes and empathizes with what's going on now today for he himself was dealt unjustly amen praise the lord and so we thank god that we do have a high priest amen that's sitting on the right hand of god amen i want to begin where we left off on last sunday we came from james the first chapter those that have their bibles amen turn with me your bibles to james the first chapter and you can also go to jeremiah amen james the first chapter and then also to the book of Jeremiah. If you get those for me, Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, that's where the crux of our message is coming from. Our subject is coming from James. So if you go with me to James, the first chapter, and Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, you'll be on point. In James, the first chapter, beginning at verse, amen, 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, 
amen, deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers of the word, of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. I'm gonna say it again. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 23 says, For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, I'm gonna say it again, if any man be a hearer, of God's word and not a doer. The Bible describes him like a man that went to the mirror and beholds himself, his natural face in the glass in the mirror. For he beholdeth himself, a man, he looks at himself and then he go away from the mirror and straightway he forget what manner of man he was. He forget if he put on his necktie. He forget if he even shaved. Uh-huh, for he beholdeth himself and goeth away and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And so I want to continue to talk and speak on the subject, Lord, help me. I have forgotten what I look like. Amen. Lord, help me. I have forgotten what I look like. Thank God for my good friend, Gail Graham. Amen. Joining us on this morning. Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, amen, and I'm not going to read all of this, but amen, it says, starting at the first verse, thus says the Lord unto me, go and get thee a linen girdle, girdle and put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. So I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord, and put it on my loins. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise and go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. So I went and hid it by Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Ephrates, and take the girl from thence, which I commanded thee to hide there. And then I went to Ephrates and digged, and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. Amen. Lord, I have become marred. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord after this manner, I will mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imaginations of the heart and walk after other gods to serve them, to worship them, to even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. For as the girdle cleave to the loan of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory. But they would not hear. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. But they would not hear. Therefore, Thus shall I speak unto them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Every bottle shall be filled with wine, and they shall say unto them, unto thee, and thou shalt say unto thee, do we not certainly know what every bottle shall be filled with wine? Then shall they say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of the land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne, and the priests and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I'm going to fill them with drunkenness. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together. So the Lord saith the Lord, I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, nor destroy them. Hear ye and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. 
And so on last Sunday, we talked about the linen girdle, this linen sash. It was a fine cloth belt worn for decoration and sometimes used to temporarily secure the pull up hem of man's robes when they were running or needed freedom from his legs. The fact that it was a linen meant it was something that was valuable. Amen. And so we see that God had instructed, amen, praise the Lord, uh, the prophet here to get something of value. Uh -huh. The garment of the priests were made of linen. You'll find that in the Vicar 6 and 14. So this material also represented Israel consecration to the Lord. But as I get a little bit further, you're going to find something that happened to their consecration to the Lord. And so the first verse, he went and got the linen girdle, the linen girdle amen. And we said last Sunday that God used Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel to enact the illustration of God's messages involved, amen, a lot of times, amen, most times these prophets participating. Uh, he told Jeremiah, put it not in water, which signified the moral filth of the nation. I want you to know today the nation we're living in now has to come to moral filth. We're recalling things that used to be wrong, we call them right, and things that used to be right, we call them wrong. We're putting good for evil and evil for good. That's in the book of Isaiah. We'll probably get to that later on. And so putting it not in water signified the moral filth of the nation. And to bury and allow time to rot, in verse 7, the waistband pictured Israel as useless to God because of sin. One thing I do not want to become to God is useless. I can't get nobody to help me now. Amen, praise the Lord. But it signified that the children of Israel had become useless. And this is a time, this message is a time of reflection, as I said on last Sunday, is a time for us to examine ourselves. As I came from 2 Corinthians, where the Bible illustrated and instructed us to examine ourselves. We're so busy examining everybody else. We're so busy critiquing everybody else, judging everybody else. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 13 to 5 to examine ourselves. Stop examining your brothers. Stop examining your sisters and take time to examine yourself. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith is to prove your own self. Know ye not your own self? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you become reprobates. And so Jeremiah was instructed not to put the linen girdle in water. The girdle that Jeremiah was to put on has been understood either as a sash worn, as a belt, or a linen undergarment that stretched from the waist <coughs> midway to the thighs. As I said, linen was the material that priests wore in the temple. Linen represented and symbolized righteousness when it was clean and white. It appears this garment was intended to be worn next to the body. It perhaps was showing his closeness with God. This linen girdle that's being worn next to the body represented one's closeness with God. It appears to me also, my brother and sister, that this garment of this nature was not shared. It was a private property. Which let me know that when you become born again, you become what? Private property. Know you not that we are bought with the price. We are bought with the blood of Jesus. We become private property. This is true with the garment of righteousness the Lord Jesus furnishes for each of us who are his. The fact that this garment might need washing indicated that it might become soiled. And you need to examine yourself and ask, you, have your, ask yourself, have you become soiled? Are you soiled with tradition? Are you soiled with jealousy? Are you soiled with envy? Are you soiled with pride? You need to ask yourself, have you become soiled? And so Jeremiah got this girdle according to the word of the Lord and put it upon his loins. Amen. And then the Bible let it know in verses 3 through 7 that Jeremiah buried this girdle by the shore of the Euphrates River. Amen. And then God had him go back and dig it up, put the girdle 
and the girdle was marred. And do you not know we have folks within the body of Christ that has become marred? We become marred with envy. We become marred with jealousy. I can't get nobody to help me now. Amen. We, be, we, we become marred, amen, praise the Lord, with emulation. We become marred. When you become marred, amen, you have, amen, praise the Lord, uh -huh, some imperfection. And we from the pulpit to the back door can attest that we do have some imperfection. We become marred with uncleanness. We become marred with lasciviousness. We become marred with envy and murder and drunkenness and raveling, and we become marred. And we have to be honest with ourselves, Lord, help me, because I become marred. Amen. Praise the Lord. You remember the time when you could not, could not wait to get to church? Amen. Praise the Lord. You could not wait until the doors of the church was open. And now you drag in here like Ananias and Sapphira, as if you're doing God a favor. Look at yourself and say, self, you have become marred. God speaks to obedient children. He comes to, Jer amen, give Jeremiah further, amen, direction here in the 4th to 11th verse. Jeremiah's journey has been various understood as a literal trip either to the western portion of the upper Euphrates, amen, praise the Lord. This lesson of message is the same as the girdle was marred, so God will mar Judah's pride. And do you not know, if you're not careful, you become so high and mighty, God will mar your pride. I can't get nobody to help me now. Uh -huh. So we got to understand, amen, praise the Lord, that Jeremiah speaks of a certain girdle as God's very own. And you've got to know, as I just already mentioned earlier, that we are God's own, amen, praise. We are, come on, 1 Corinthians 3 and 16 says, no, you're not. You don't know who you are. You forgot what and who you are. No, you're not that we are what? The temple of God, amen, praise the Lord. You've got to know who you are. No, you're not. Amen. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile, if, anybody, if any man mars the temple of God, if anyone corrupts the temple of God, the Bible decides, says that, amen, amen, the temple of God, him shall, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Can I keep talking here? Amen. We got to realize, amen, that we are the temple of God, and my body belongs to God. My body don't belongs to myself. And so, as a man, Proverbs, I mean, uh, Paul picked it up in Romans. I cannot take that which belongs to God and make them members of a heart. I'm not going to leave that alone today. But Jeremiah speaks of a certain girdle as God's very own. It was a belt that the Lord said He girded Himself with, one that clave and clung to Him from a time. But eventually he cast off this ruined and marred, good for nothing girdle. Uh -huh. The girdle of God represents a people who once had been called by his name, uh -huh. set apart by covenant, tremendously anointed and appointed by God, near to God's heart, dearly loved and much blessed. Uh -huh. They were wholly sanctified. Remnant people bound closely to the Lord by his covenant promises. God has said he will gird himself with the pure remnant, amen, as he goes forth in these days, last days, to battle with his enemy. But it's going to be kind of hard, amen, praise the Lord, if we've been marred with pride, if we've been marred with envy, if we've been marred with jealousy. So Isaiah 11 to 5 confirms that God will gird himself only with righteousness, in faithful people. Can I keep talking here? Uh huh. And so we find, amen, in Revelation 1 and 3, 1 and 13, 1, like the Son of God, like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the pap's breast with a golden girdle. Jesus will be wearing a golden girdle, amen, as he comes forth, amen, for his work of judgment. Jesus will be wearing a girdle. The girdle will be like the one worn by the high priest in Exodus 39, verse 13. I mean, verse 3, it was an ornament bejeweled and woven with golden threads. Amen. Jesus was commanded by God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And just like Jeremiah, he was commanded by God to go and get a linen girdle and to wear it without washing it. Amen. Uh -huh. And so Jeremiah went and got this girdle, as I said on last Sunday, Amen. And then the guessing game began. 
uh -huh, the educated preachers, the educated rulers, the educated priests pride themselves with interpreting, amen, praise the Lord, for the people, the prophet's message. They probably told them it's very obvious to God that God is saying to us what we already affirm, what we already know, that we are his chosen priesthood, his holy nation, a royal people, that we are his chosen. We are the girdle worn proudly, amen. We're his glory, we're his strength. The excellency of ages united to him by covenant. Amen. So the properly educated preachers and teachers, they pride themselves with interpreting the messages from the prophet. And as the prophet walked by and you could almost hear the people, like I said on last Sunday, go ahead, Jeremiah, we got the message boy. you. Go ahead, preach it, preach it. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, you know, you can see them getting behind Jeremiah. We got the word. We got the word. Amen. But in a short time, the same preachers, the same priests, started frowning on Jeremiah. Yes, they did. You know, just like when you preach and teach the word of God, the unadulterated word of God, folks are going to start frowning. They watch Jeremiah with deep puzzlement because day by day, the girdle got dirtier. You know, come about you You know, the further you get away from God, the dirtier you become. Y'all can get up off me here. It was become soiled and unclean. And I need you to examine yourself and ask, you, ask yourself, have you become soiled and unclean? Spots were beginning to appear. And I believe some of us got some spots in our life. Amen. You got to know that when Jesus comes back, He's coming back for a church without a spot and without a wrinkle. Can I keep talking here? The prophet, however, Ezekiel 24, verse 6, the prophet kept wearing him. And why is he not daily washing away? Wonder. The people want to know why was Jeremiah wearing this girdle without taking it to the laundromat? Why was he washing this girdle without taking it down and washing it? They, they all knew the girdle represented them. I come to tell you today. The girdle represents the house of God. Uh, the girdle represents the people of God. Uh huh. And so they knew that the girdle represents. So why would Jeremiah allow it to cling to him with filth and with stench? I can't keep talking here. Uh, soon they became angry. Uh huh. With Jeremiah. And when you preach the word of God, folks gonna get angry with you. When you tell folks the truth, they gonna get angry with you. Amen. Uh, I'm gonna act you like Paul said. Have I become your enemy? me because I tell you the truth Jesus said blessed is he that's not offended in me nor my words and so uh-huh they started hissing they got angry because the Jewish mind of that day cleanliness represents godliness uh-huh just like it was then and so is it now cleanliness does represent godliness but somewhere along the way we have become stained somewhere along the way. We have become marred when a man or a woman, amen, praise the Lord, do not have no conviction. They can do what they want to do under the sun, amen. There's not no conviction. Uh-huh, and so the children of Israel could no longer believe that the girl represented them. They must have ran, they must have ran to the priest and said, this girl can't mean us, this girdle can't be us. But do you not know every word in the Bible comes to us? Can I keep talking? It comes to the saints. It comes to the church of God. Amen. Because the Bible was written for our learning. Can I keep talking? Uh-huh. The Bible is written for you and for me. And so God, they came to the, they came to the priest and said, the girl can't mean us because God does not allow dirt to cling to him. Uh-huh. Let me ask you a question. If God do not allow dirt to cling to him, why are you you're allowing dirt to clean in you. You can get up off me here today. Amen. Praise the Lord. What do you mean I'm allowing dirt to clean in me? Fornication is cleaning in you. Uh huh. Sexual promiscuity is cleaning in you. Lust is cleaning in you. That's all is what I'm talking about. You got dirt that's clinging to you. But the Bible says, I feel like preaching up in here. Come now and let us reason together out of Isaiah. The first chapter of the Bible said, Come now, let us reason together. Let us talk it over. Amen. Praise the Lord. Huh? Though your dirt, though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. They shall be wool. If you be willing, somebody ought to shout willing. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the lamb. Oh, yes. But if you refuse and rebel, 
you shall be devoured with the sword. Yes, they could no longer believe that that girdle represented them. Uh-huh. We sacrifice, we pay tithes, we keep the law. Uh-huh. But yet it's still our heart has been moved far from God. I'd like to pick up where I left off on last Sunday now. Amen. Out of 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Amen. Because we have become marred. We're singing and shouting, hook and Messiah and all the other stuff, but we have become marred. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, the Bible let us know. Uh -huh, we, I'll give you time to get there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh -huh, verse 1. It says, this know also that in the last days, and I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that we are living in the last days, that perilous times shall come. I want you to know dangerous times are already knocking at our door. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Uh-huh, we're living in that day now. They covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unfaithful and unholy. That's the dirt. That's the stain. And how men shall become lovers. Men shall be lovers, amen, praise the Lord, of their own selves. They selfish. They was, amen. We got folks in the church that just as selfish as can be. I can't get nobody to help me. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Without natural affection. They don't even have natural affection. What do you consider natural affection? A natural affection is for a man to be attracted to a woman. A woman be attracted to a man. That's a natural affection. Uh -huh. Not a woman attracted to another woman. Not a man attracted to another man. That's unnatural. Y'all don't like me up in here. Don't turn me off. Don't turn me off. Don't turn me off. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's natural affection. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so the Bible even talk about in Romans, amen, 1 and 26, for this cause God gave them all up unto vow affections. Even their woman did change their natural use into that which is against nature. The woman changed that was natural use against nature. Now women sleeping with women. Y'all don't like me up in here. Uh-huh. It's an abomination. I don't care what nobody else says. I don't care whether they Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist. I'm not Baptist, but I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I'm not Methodist, but I got the method to salvation. And I know I'm not pressing, I'm not press, I'm not a Presbyterian, but I'm pressing to the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is Christ Jesus. I'm going to teach and I'm going to preach it. Likewise, also the men. I'm in Romans 1 and 27. Also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. They go oh, shando, hallelujah. Uh -huh, burn in the lust one towards another. Men with men working that which unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error which are me. So that's what's happening. Folks have left their natural affection. They become truth breakers. They tell a lie. I never felt, I never thought nobody could lie better than I did before I got saved until uh, huh, President 45 got in there. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh huh. Praise the Lord. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, hiding, high minded. You ever been to church with folks so high minded? They walk with their head all up in the air, like, amen, break they all that in the back of chips. Y'all know what I would say. But I'm live streaming now, so I'm just say please. Uh huh. High minded love of pleasures more than the love of God. Look at the fifth verse, having a form of godliness. Uh huh. Uh huh. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. And that's the day and time we're living in. Now I've come to tell you today, you got to beware of a form of godliness. You got to beware of formalism. Is that all right? Can I keep teaching here? Uh -huh, praise the Lord. They got a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Uh huh. For of this sort are they which creep in the houses. They creep into the pulpit. They creep on the old God of Sunday. They creep on the old They then creep in on the keyboard. They then creep in on the drums. I can't get over help me. Uh huh. Of such this sort they are which creep into the houses and leave. 
captive, silly women, laden with sin, led away with divers and lust, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Can I all shun to her? And as Jonas and Jingris withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. And we got folks today that's going to resist the truth, huh? but that never takes away or distract from the truth. You must be born again. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so they resisted the truth. And we got men and women out there now huh, that are resisting the truth. Amen. Huh? But the Bible declares, amen, that you shall know the truth huh? because it is a truth that's going to make you free. Huh? It is a truth that's going to set you free. Amen. Huh? And I just want you to be free. That's all I want you to do. Huh? Uh, glory to God. Huh? And so the Bible declares in John the eighth chapter, huh? and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Huh? Uh, glory to God. In the 36th verse, it says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I just need to know, do you want to be free? Free from sin, free from bondage, free from drug addicts, free from sexual promiscuity. Do you want to be free, amen, huh? but having a form of godliness, huh? but denying the power thereof. Huh? And so the Bible said, now as Janus and Jambres huh, were still Moses, folks are there to withstand me today. Huh? Uh -huh, praise the Lord. Huh? So do these also research the truth. Amen. Huh? Men of corrupt mind, huh? reprobates concerning the faith. Huh? They, but they shall proceed no further. Huh? Because the Bible declares that when the enemy comes in like a flood, huh? the Spirit of God is going to lift up a standard. Can I keep preaching here? Huh? Uh -huh, but they've been for the folly shall be manifest huh, unto all men as there also was a man. Huh? And so we got to understand that these verses are a continuation from 2 Samuel, the second chapter. Huh? They reveal clearly to us that those who live undisciplined lives, huh? and we got folks that live in undisciplined lives, huh? and see, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ without discipline, huh? because the word disciple comes from the root word discipline. Huh? And one thing I found out about the Lord huh, that when God comes into your life, huh, he comes with discipline. Huh? We got so many undisciplined folks in the church now, huh, and you wonder why folks don't want to get saved. Huh? Uh, glory to God. Huh? But the Bible, oh yes, huh, the Bible declares huh, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, huh, if any man be in Christ, huh, he is now a disciplined follower. Huh? If any man be in Christ, huh, he is a new creature, huh? Uh -huh, my new creation. Huh? I am now disciplined, huh? where well, before I wasn't disciplined. Huh? I did everything I was grown enough and big enough to do. Huh? But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Huh? Old things and old habits huh? are passed away. Huh? And behold, all things become new. Huh? Can I keep preaching him? Huh? And so here they revere, uh, huh? they revere clearly to us that those who live on this lives huh? and who do their own thing huh? and set their own standard for life huh? as can also continue to carry beliefs of a form of godliness. Huh? you got to beware and be careful, amen. Huh? I heard somebody just say, stop creeping, amen. Huh? You need to stop creeping, amen. Huh? you creeping from one house to another house. Huh? you creeping, you tiptoeing through the tulips. Huh? Can I keep on preaching here today? Uh-huh, praise the Lord. Huh? And so people that are undisciplined huh, is going to do their own thing huh, and then justify their actions. Huh? The Bible says in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, huh, I feel like preaching the Bible. Huh? In Isaiah 5, amen, huh? the Bible says, Woe unto them, huh? glory to God, huh? that call evil good huh? and good evil, amen. Huh? Isaiah 5 and 20, huh? that put evil darkness for light and light for darkness, huh? that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitterness. Huh? Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. Huh? They got so wise in their own eyes, huh? can't nobody tell them nothing. Huh? And prune it in their own sight. Amen. Huh? Proverbs, hallelujah. Huh? Now Proverbs want to talk here. Huh? Hallelujah. In huh? Proverbs 17 and 15, huh? he that justified the wicked huh? and he that condemned the just, huh? even they both are abomination 
unto the Lord. Amen. And we got folks justifying their actions. Oh, glory to God. When a pastor can go out and commit adultery and then got the nerve and the audacity to stand behind a pulpit and say God allowed him to. Look at your neighbor and name him. The devil is a liar. It was just a sin that he was still in. Amen. Can I keep preaching him? But because a person undisciplined, they're going to do their own things. They're going to set their own standards for life. Amen. Uh -huh. Also, they're going to continue to believe a form of godliness. A form is merely an appearance that has no relationship to reality. And we got folks that have an appearance but have no relationship to reality. The reality is, if you don't become born again, hell is going to be your home. Can I keep preaching him? It is an outward form. And folks are outward performing. We got a lot of performers in the church. They perform so well. The Bible, the Bible says that if it was possible, they'll fool and deceive the very elect. Amen. It is an outward show. It's an outward appearance to make a pretense and to maintain a facade. But God Lord Jesus, godliness, however, has to do with the way we live. I didn't need to know something about Shonda. Do I have any godly folks out here today? I want you to know today that godliness is not a denomination. We all must be holy. The Bible says to be you holy for I am holy. I don't care whether you're Presbyterian, Baptist, or Methodist, or Catholic. I don't care if you're apostolic, Church of God in Christ. You still got to be holy because holiness without the Bible said no man is going to see God. Can I keep preaching here? Oh, yes. So godliness, however, has to do with the way we live. I need you to ask yourself, how are you living today? It's impact and changes our life and those around us. When Jesus came into my life, old things became old. The old things passed away. And behold, all things become new. Can I preach up in here as the word godliness implies it has to do with holiness. Holiness to live like God. I thank you Holy Ghost. The Bible the Bible declares the holiness without a man nobody's going to see the Lord. Can I keep preaching him? Thank you Lord. And so let me tell you my brothers and sisters, we see from scriptures quoted above that people will fall into a habit of living ungodly lives. But I want you to know a man when Jesus walked in cocaine walked out. When Jesus walked in Hash walked out when Jesus walked in. Oh my Bashandum. Jim Bean walked out when Jesus walked in. All things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. I need to know. Have you become marred? Are you that rotted and decayed girdle that Jeremiah was wearing? And the people know they God God They become a stench in the nostrils of God. Can I keep preaching here? Thank you, Lord. And so let me tell you, thank you, <coughs> people has fallen uh, into a habit uh, of living ungodly life. Uh, and before I became born again, uh, I want you to hear me, Brother Jeff. Uh, before I became born again, uh, I had a habit uh, of living ungodly life. Uh, I had a habit uh, I could not break. Uh, can I preach up in here? Uh, I had a habit uh, of getting high and drunk. Uh, I had a habit uh, of running women. Uh, but when Oh, Lord, when, when Jesus came into my life, old things passed away, and behold, all things become new. Can I keep preaching him? You got to understand, at the same time, they continue to hold a form of godliness. A form of godliness does not alter a person's lifestyle. Thank you, Lord. I need to know. 
go. Can a leopard change a spot? Thank you, Lord. I need to know. Can you save yourself? I need to know. Thank you, Lord. Can you save yourself? The Bible says in Jeremiah. Let's go back to 13. Thank you, Lord. In Jeremiah 13 and 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard change his spot? They made they may they do good. That's been accustomed to do do evil. I told myself time and time again when I was out there drugging and drinking, I was gonna stop on my own. But I realized I was powerless. I was powerless against sin. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that Jesus broke that cycle. Huh? Jesus huh, came into my life. Huh? And so just like you can't change yourself, huh? just like you cannot alter the way you live, huh? it takes the blood, huh? the blood of Jesus. Huh? And so can the Ethiopian huh, change his skin? or a leper his spot, huh? then may you also huh? do good that are accustomed huh? to do evil. Huh? I can't help it. Huh? It's like Phil Wilson said, huh? the devil made me do it. Huh? Oh, glory to God. Huh? And so Paul understood this. Huh? And so Paul said in Romans, huh? the seventh chapter, can I keep preaching, huh? that when I want to do good, huh? when I want to do that which is right, huh? I found a tug of war huh? going on on the inside. Huh? And so Paul says, huh, for that which I do, huh, in Romans 7 and 15, huh, I allow not huh, for what I would huh, that I do not. Huh, but what I hate, <coughs> what I hate, I end up doing. Huh, and then I do that, huh, that which is I do it not. Huh, then if I do that which I would not, I consider to the law huh, that it is good. Huh, there's nothing wrong with the law. Huh, the law was a schoolmaster. Huh, I would not know what sin was huh, without the law. Huh, but what the law huh, could not do, huh, thank you, Jesus, huh, for what the law huh, could not do, huh, and that was weak through my flesh, huh, God sent his son huh, in the likeness of flesh huh, to condemn sin in the flesh. Huh. And so Paul struggled huh, just like you and I struggled huh, before I became born again. Huh. He said, for I know that in me huh, oh Lord, huh, that dwelleth in me, huh, oh glory to God. Huh. He said, now then there's no more I that do those things, huh, but it's the sin that's still in my life. Huh. It's the sin that I refuse to give up. Huh. It's the sin that has marred my life. Huh. It's the sin that called me to be a stench huh, in the nostrils of God. <coughs> and so a form of godliness do not alter the way a person lives. It allows them to do what they want to do. Uh-oh, I'm going to say it again. A form of godliness uh -huh, does not alter a way a person lives. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord, but it allows them to do what they want to do anyhow, to set their own standard. And what has happened in the church, we have went about to set our own standard. Y'all remember some preacher come years ago talking about raising the standard? You cannot raise the standard of God. God's standard stands sure all by itself. We have to meet God's standard. Can I keep teaching, preaching here? Uh-huh, praise the Lord. And amen, but to set their own standard and yet proclaim that it is acceptable to God and therefore God Godly, uh -huh, what they believe and do. Amen. This is a big deception of religion today. This is a big bamboozlement. Amen. Praise the Lord of religion and salvation today. It allows standards that God disapproved. God is not going to lower his standard for me and God is not going to lower his standard for you. I can't get nobody to help me now. If it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you. I had somebody come to me some years ago and try to tell me what is a sin for me is not a sin for them. The last time I checked, my Bible said all sin is sin. I can't get nobody to help me. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Go to Ecclesiastes. Y'all don't want me to talk about here. Go to Ezekiel, not Ecclesiastes. He has to go to Ezekiel and they're going to try to tell me what's a sin for them is not a it was a sin for me is not a sin for them. I can't get nobody to help me. I said the devil is a lie. All sin is sin. And so what about Shah? And so the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8 and 20, the soul that sinneth, that means you continue 
you habitually live in sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son, of, the son shall not bear the sin of the father, and neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the sin of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. I can't get nobody to help me. And so you got to understand, in verse 31, he said, cast away from you all your transgressions. He said, cast away from you all your filth, everything that's marring your life. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. Spiritful, why will you die, O house of Israel? Verse 32, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. God don't get no pleasure out of you dying in sin. I can't get nobody to help me. The only one that get pleasure out of you dying in sin is the devil. I can't get nobody to help me. God do not get no pleasure out of you dying in sin. The Bible says in Isaiah 5, verse 14, the hell has enlarged itself uh -huh, and open her mouth up without measure. You know hell is waiting for you. If you don't want to clean yourself up, if you don't want to allow God to clean you up, hell is waiting for you. I can't get nobody to help me. I don't, it don't make no sense for me to live in hell and then die to go to hell. Can I keep talking here? And so this is the big deception of religion today. It allows standards that God disapproves of, uh-huh, yet seeks to convince us that it's in fact okay, it's acceptable. The religious world has no serious conviction. I'm going to say it again. The religious world. You look at this president, he talk about the evangelicals. I don't know who they are, but they listening, they need to get, they need to get on their knees, they get the need to go to Oshun, and they get to know the Shondo, they need to get to know Jesus for themselves. He talks how the evangelicals are behind him. Well, I want him to know if he's listening. I'm evangelical, and I am against everything that's against God's word. I can't get nobody to help me today. Thank you, Jesus. Uh -huh. The religious world has no serious conviction about passing their legislation that encourage people to live in direct rebellion to the scriptures. The religious world has no serious conviction about passing last legislation that allow one set of people to oppress another set of people. I'm talking about the religious world. If my people which are called by my name, I didn't know do we have any of God's people. There are three things that I want to bring out in this message. Have any form of godliness, denying the power thereof, and then a such turn away. What is formalism? I'm glad you asked, Brenda. Formalism is strict adherence to or observance of prescribed or traditional forms. I'm going to say again, formalism is strict adherence to or observance of uh huh, or prescribed of tradition forms as in music, poetry, or even art. It is a strict adherence to some man made legislation. I can't get nobody to help me. And so, formalism from the religion standpoint is a strong attachment to external. Somebody shout external. External form of observance. Amen. Praise the Lord. A doctrine that acts are in themselves right or wrong regardless of the consequences. And so folks have a form of godliness. Uh -huh. they, they, amen. They even speak in an unknown tongue. It's so unknown God don't recognize it. I can't get nobody to help me. A form of God. You got to understand Christianity and salvation was never ever a form of godliness. I'm going to say it again. Christianity and salvation was never ever a form of godliness. It has always been the real thing. Godliness, somebody shout godliness. Godliness is that lifestyle which glorifies. I hear minister, I hear minister ever say all the time. Amen. Praise. Amen. Which glorifies God. Godliness is that lifestyle which glorifies God. Godliness is that lifestyle that brings glory to God. I can't get nobody to help me. If you living a lifestyle, amen, other than that brings glory to God, you need to become born again. God is that, amen, amen, it is that which allows the Holy Ghost to set God's standard in our lives. <clears throat> Before I became born again, I didn't have no standard. Whatever I wanted to do, I did. I can't get nobody to help me because it was in my power to do those things. Uh-huh. But it is, it, uh, but the godliness, uh-huh, uh huh. Is that is that is that which allows the Holy Ghost to set God's standard in and upon our lives? Godliness sets the pattern for us. Thank you, Sister Wright. 
uh huh, not as dictating to God what is acceptable. I don't know where you get from dictating to God what is acceptable, uh huh, and what is not acceptable. And our belief system does not change our life. If our belief system does not change our life and bring us into more direct, amen, and closer and walk in personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then we have a serious question of authenticity. Are you authentic? Uh-huh. It does not matter whether a form of godliness comes from a prophet, from the pope, from a dynamic preacher, or from some religious church system. It doesn't matter. If it does not line up, somebody shout line up. If it does not line up with the clear teachings of the word of God, with the scriptures, turn away from a run. Again, I say run. Tragically, so many of our religious systems today can only demonstrate, can only demonstrate a form of godliness. Yet many of them started out on fire for the Lord. They started out on fire, amen, out in the fire of the Holy Ghost revival. But over time, over time, over time, uh-huh, the standards of holiness and godliness have deteriorated. And the conviction that they used to have between right and wrong has become less and less until the day we see right is wrong and wrong is right. And God is such a God of love. He won't turn any of us to hell. God won't turn any of us away from eternal life. The devil is a lie. The soul that sinneth, we just read in Ezekiel 18, 33. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Y'all want me to go a little bit further? Amen. Praise the Lord. I know y'all scared. Amen. Praise the Lord of Revelation. But let me go to Revelation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. The Bible says in Revelation 22 and 11, he that is unjust, let him, let him be what? Unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and I'm Omega. I'm beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. And blessed are they. Come on, look at the Bible. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they that do, amen, his commandments. That they may, amen, have a right to the tree of life. Amen. Praise the Lord. May enter in through the gates into the city. For what without all dogs, amen, outside the city, all dogs, uh -huh, dog, 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 dog. I know y'all got some dogs in the church. I don't like me up in here. For without all dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Mm-hmm. That's what's without. That's the Bible. You don't like it, tear out your Bible, ball it up, and stump on it. And so we see here, amen, praise the Lord, uh -huh, that over time, people that used to be on fire for God, that would not compromise for a dollar bill, that would not compromise for an Abe Lincoln, would, would not compromise for money, their standards have deteriorated. Amen, praise the Lord. And the conviction between right and wrong has become blurry and blurry. Less and less until today we see right is wrong and wrong is right. And God is such a God that he won't send us to hell, but that's a lie. It's a false doctrine of everyone doing that which is right in their own sight. Look at Judges 21. I'm about to close for today. Judges 21. Uh-huh. I'm about to close. Amen. Praise the Lord. Judges 21. You don't like it, tear out your Bible, ball up a stump on it. Judges 21. Verse 25, Judges 21, verse 25, it says, And in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It seems like we're dealing with no days now. Everybody doing that which is right in their own eyes. I think one of the greatest tragedies, tra tra tragedies and shocks in our lives in the life anyone could ever have would be to have a relationship with God, go to church faithfully all their lives, yet not really never knowing Jesus for themselves. And when they stand before God, they hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Yet that is exactly what a form of godliness does to people. It is a deception that allows them to set low standards for their lives 
than that which is acceptable by God. It allows people to justify their character traits, make excuses for their ungodly ways, justify their selfish lifestyle, live in sin, persecute the believers of the truth, and etc. Yet, ironically, they still believe they have a seat in the kingdom. They still believe they have an authority to speak on behalf of God. They get up in the pulpit. Amen. It's amazing how folks go around now. Everybody want to be a prophet and a prophetess. Everybody want to be a pastor. You know what? I never ascribed to be none of those things. I just want to be saved. I did not scribe. I did not politic. I did not, amen, praise the Lord campaign to become a preacher. I didn't even want to preach. I can't get anybody to help me. I just wanted to be saved. When it came to pastoring, I did not raise my hand and say, Lord, here am I. I'll go. No, I didn't. I just love being saved. I can't get anybody to help me. Uh-huh. But it's amazing how today folks politics in the church. Politics is running the church. We have become so political, there's no more spirituality in the bodies of Christ. Y'all don't light me up in here. Amen. Praise the Lord. We vote folks in and we vote folks out. But the last time I checked, Jeremiah 3 and 15 said, I'm going to give you pastors according to my heart. Uh, that's not the case today. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, ironically, they think they believe that they're speaking on God's behalf. They believe they know better than the truth of Jesus Christ. They believe a form of godliness allowed them to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Uh-oh, I know I didn't say that. Boasters and proud blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, and unforgiving. Slanderers, they run around slandering your name without self-control, brutal, despise of good, traitors, headstrong. You ever met somebody headstrong? You can't tell them nothing. Haughty lovers of pleasure rather than the love of God. You'll find that in 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 4. All those traits corrupt us rather than make us more like God. All those traits I just read, they corrupt us more than make us godliness or godly. Yet in spite of all these things, they still cling to, on to the form of godliness to make it all right. We certainly need to ask ourselves this question. Whose standards are we living by? Are we living by our standards? Are we living by man's standards? Are we living by the standards of God? And so, as I close, amen, I want to close with Matthew, the 15th chapter, 1 through 9. This was a time when the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus. Uh-huh. And they wanted to know how come the disciples were eating without even washing their hands. You know, we got folks in the church that can spot everybody else's fault but their own. And so in Matthew, the 15th chapter, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples sin? Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? You know, we can find everybody else's fault. We can find everybody else's transgressions but our own. So they want to know why did the disciples, amen, transgress the traditions of the elders, for they washed not their hands when they did eat bread. And so the interview with the Pharisees, verses 1 through 9, shows that it is characteristic of sticklers of external custom. They were stickler of external custom. They were stickler of external custom. I'm going to say again, they were sticklers of external custom. What do you mean? When saying they were sticklers, they adhered to the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. I can't get anybody to help me. And if you don't come in here with a long dress, I'm about to mess with some people now. If you don't come here with a long dress, do not say, you Jezebel, I can't get nobody to help me. If you don't come to church with a tie, a shirt and a tie on, you need to be born again. They were sticklers, uh-huh, praise the Lord, of the external custom and the ceremonies of religion. The Pharisees in all ages, to be tolerant about little and belittling questions, to be inconsistent, unrighteous. This is what, the, this is what, this is what Pharisees mean. Uh-huh, even according to their own standard, and hypocritical. And we got a lot of Pharisees in the church today. They are sticklers to the external custom. They are a stickler, y'all don't light me up in here, to a man religious ceremony. Praise the Lord. They know how to serve communion. They know how to wash your feet, but they don't know the meaning and the purpose behind washing one another's feet. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. They know how to go through the baptismal ceremony, external things. They can do all the religious orders of the church they can't live holy. Mm -hmm. 
And so this ever recurring mistake in making religion consist of meat and drink is further rebuked in the saying to the multitude in verse 10 through 11, while the offense taken by the Pharisees, verse 12, form the basis of declaration of the Phariseeism is not of God's planting and to be destroyed, defeating itself. So as we look here, they ask them, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Uh -huh. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God through by your tradition? Now you notice anytime Jesus was asked a question, he always answered the question with a question. If you didn't notice that before, go back and study. Anytime Jesus was approached with a question, he always answered the question with a question. And so they asked him, why did the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Jesus responded, so why do you transgress the commandments of God? I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. Caught them off guard, didn't he? He said, for God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother, and he that curses his father and mother, let him die the death. But you, in turn, you want to go around and establish your own righteousness. Whosoever shall say to his father and mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest, depart by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandments of God of none effect by your own tradition. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so, ye hypocrites, you mean Jesus called somebody a hypocrite? You know, folks get upset you call them a hypocrite today. Matter of fact, I had somebody tell me some years ago, amen, the reason they don't go to church because there are too many hypocrites. I told them they get saved, they'd be one less hypocrite. I can't get nobody to help me. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy unto you, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and on me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 9, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. Uh-huh. And so Jesus flipped the script on them. They didn't see that coming. Uh-huh. And so Phariseeism is the doctrine of practice of the Pharisees, especially strict observers of traditional or written laws. And we got, we got some Phariseeisms in the church. Amen. They strictly observe. They're in church every Sunday, but in the club on Saturday. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh -huh. The doctrine, the Phariseeism, is the doctrine, practice, or the character and spirit of the Pharisees. Rigid observers of the external form, that's what Phariseeism is. It is the rigid observance of the external form of religion without genuine piety. Uh -huh. Hypocrisy in religion. A censorous, a self-righteous spirit. You ever met folks that are self-righteous? Nobody going to heaven but them? Have a self-righteous spirit in matters of moral and manner. Hypo hypocritical observance of the letter of religion or moral laws without regard for the spirit, sanctimoniousness. That's what we call it. And so you got to understand the parable shows the nature of real defilement. Moral purity or impurity is from the heart, not from the food. Still less from the observance of neck the ceremonial wash of the hands before eating bread. On this point, Jesus' words in verse 16 are still applicable. I can't get nobody to help me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh-huh. Are you still without understanding? Even yet are ye also without understanding. We have people in the church that are without understanding. Uh-huh. I was, I was, I'm not gonna say that. I'll come back to it later. Not scribes or Pharisees, but representative of the part of the Pharisees, included scribes. That's what scribes are. They were representative of the Pharisees' party. Uh-huh. Including scribes, possibly a formal deputation from the Sanhedrin from Jerusalem. They came apparently with a definite and hostile purpose. And so when you go to Mark 7, I like Mark 7 as well, Mark 7 and 1, then came together unto, the, unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scripts which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with the foul, amen, with the foul hands, they said to them, with unwashed hands, they found fault. And we got a lot of fault finders in the church. Yes, they do. Amen. Some are in the pulpit. Some is on the choir. Some is on the usher board. We got a lot of fault finders in the church because they are marred. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. And so, amen, here we find in Mark, Mark 7, they came to Jesus with a hostile and purpose. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they washed their hand, of eat not, holding to the tradition of the elders. And we got folks that have put tradition of the church of God in Christ over the word of God. I can't get anybody to help me. 
And trust me, you're not going to get them to break these ceremonial traditions. I can't get anybody to help me. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. I might get in trouble now. And so nevertheless, amen, Mark 7, probably the eight the Galilean Pharisees or less likely in the consequences of the conduct of the disciples of our Lord at the recent Passover feast in Jerusalem. And so why do your disciples transgress? Why do your disciples break the law? They had seen them transgress. Amen. Praise the Lord. As noted in Mark 7 and 2. When we saw some of your disciples eat bread with unwashed hands. We saw them. We, and you got to know when you become born again, when you pronounce to the word you are saved, you're going to have somebody round on your street corner. You're going to have somebody watching you. And as soon as you mess up or what they consider to be messed up, the first thing out of their mouth is I thought you're supposed to be a Christian. I'd had that so many times growing up in the Lord. Folks come to me, so I thought you're supposed to be saved. I said, I am. I'm just striving for perfection. I can't get nobody to help me. You're, going not, you're not going to make me denounce who I am a God? Uh-uh. No way. Uh-uh. And so I, I be thanking them. When they come to me and say, well, I thought you were supposed to be saved. I thought you was a Christian. I reach out and I shake their hand. I said, thank you. You helped me stay saved. I didn't get upset with them. You let somebody come to us somebody, and you and you did something they thought was against God's word. I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. Next thing I know, you didn't got all blown up, huffy and puffy. That's not the spirit of God. And so when they would come to me like that, I would reach out and shake their hand and say, thank you, because you helped me stay saved. I can't get nobody to help me. Mm-hmm. So what I did, I reversed what the devil meant for evil. Yes, that's what I was shot. And so, amen. And so the tradition of the elders certainly ruled hand, rules handed down by words of the mouth of Moses and the fathers in Galatians 1 and 14. Elders referred to as the authority figures, not the upholders. They were just the authors. Amen. They authored the, amen, the law. That's what the elders were. Amen. And not the upholders. These are these traditional customs. The Jews attach greater value to tradition even over the written word of God. And we got folks that are, amen, they are so traditionalized, you can't even get them to praise the Lord. Uh-huh. And so moreover, especially did they pay respect to the additional injunction, the washing of the hand, as you'll find in Leviticus 15 and 11. For they washed not their hands when they ate some cornbread. I can't get nobody to help me. The explanation here in Mark 7, 3 through 4, the washing refer, amen, referred to was not an act of cleanliness, but a ceremonial washing performed with meticulous care. Uh-huh. The Pharisees assumed the authority of this tradition. Jesus opposed not the custom, but the principle that they assumed. Uh -huh. Because you got to understand, Jesus, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to do what the law could not do. I came to fulfill the law. So Jesus did not have no problem with the custom. He did not oppose. Amen. So Jesus opposes not the custom. He was opposing the principles that was being applied. I can't get nobody to help me now. Notice the belittled influence of the legalism. Matthews 15 and 3, why do they transgress? Why do they neglect is, ne amen, is, ne ne is knowledge by the tradition at attack? And for the sake of your tradition, Jesus said you break the laws of God by, amen, trying to keep your own tradition. You break the laws of God. In order to keep your own human tradition, you are violating the commandments of God. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. And so Mark 7 and 9 goes a little bit further. For well, you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own tradition. Uh-huh, that's in the Bible. You don't like it, tear it out, ball up and stump on it. And so this is direct of God's command. We set aside, we have set God's command aside for tradition by those who claim to be the strictest observers of the written law of God. And so back in Matthew 15 and 6, they talk about how they honor their mother and their father. Best authorities omitted. And yes, you may say, whosoever shall say, etc. God said he shall not honor his father. The Pharisee directly denied the validity of the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and mother, that their days may be long upon the earth. The, uh, the, the Pharisee directly denied the validity of the fifth commandment. And there are two other views, both of them requiring the insertion of in, uh huh, one, that the common version, whosoever shall say, etc., have the consequences, he shall be set free. Go back to Matthews. Or the other makes the less cause of the judgment. Ye say, whosoever shall say, etc., he is not bound by the law. You're contradicting yourself. As my ancestor would say, you speak with forked tongue. Mm -hmm. And so, 
Uh huh. And they made void. They made void. They made void. They made void the commandments of God by hanging on to their tradition. And so you have a form of godliness. And so this girdle, this girdle we're talking about, represented the children of Israel. They had a form of godliness. I'm going to get there. Not amen. And so you make void in verse three. In verse three. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why do you transgress the commandments of God? Which by your tradition. This is what Jesus was asking them. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so Jesus basically let them know you have annihilated, you have, you have made of none effect the commandments of God by your own tradition. You make void. For the sake of your own tradition, you make void. Modern Phariseeism, amen, praise the Lord, does the same. Church tradition leads to dogmas. We got a lot of dogmas out here. Church tradition leads to dogmas which denies God's direct commands. Uh huh. It defend, it's defenders and supporter persecute not only for the infraction of the interpretation of God's law, but for disregard and precepts of their own making. Or at least they constantly break Jesus' laws of love. Uh huh. Their zeal of external things about Jesus give no express command. And so in Matthew 15 and 7, Jesus called them hypocrites. This word had not quite so strong sense until now. It includes those self-deceived. Mark, Matthew 8 and 5, it goes a little bit further. Mark 15 and 8 said, Thou draw nigh unto me with the mouth and with the lips, but the heart is far from me. The people are here, the brief performance is now an established reading. Their heart is far from me in the Hebrew. The heart they have removed far from me. The application here first is to the generation of Isaiah. If you go to Isaiah, amen, praise the Lord, 29 and 13, it says, Wherefore the Lord say, For as much as this people draw near with me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear, their fear, we heard about that in Sunday school this morning, their fear, their reverence toward me, their respect towards me, amen, is taught, amen, is taught by the precept of men. And so their heart had been removed from me, applies first to the generation of Isaiah by the description that the unbelieving Jews in all ages. And so vain worship is what's happening now. Vain worship. The text here in Isaiah 29 verse 13 implies vain worship. And I need to know is your worship in vain? I need to know, is your praising God in vain? Uh-huh, praise the Lord. And so these people draw near to me with their mouth, an army with their lips, yet, yet they have removed their hearts far from me. Moreover, the worship towards me is taught after the doctrine and precept of men. Even by the time Jesus came, many religious leaders were false in their worship. Just like the day, now that Jesus came and left, we got a lot of religious leaders, amen, with false worship. God was honored with the mouths. God was honored with the lips. But then, amen, praise the Lord, he was insulted in their practices. Y'all don't like me up in here. We'll get in church and say, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You can't bring nothing in here you don't have. I can't get nobody to help me. So the folks that honor him with their lips, they insult the God in their practices. The stark example of this is the second occasion of which Jesus cleansed the temple by driving out those who were dis desecrating the house of the Lord in Matthew 21. Thou, my house shall be called what? The house of prayer, but you end up making it what? The den of thieves. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, amen, the temple cleansed. There were two occasions in which Jesus drove people from the temple. John 2, 13 through 22, and Matthew 21, 12 through 13. Amen. Jesus showed concern for the desecrating and decretion of his people from true worship and service to the Lord and to the hypocrisy and vanity of religion that practices. And so Isaiah 29, verse 13, he wrote, in Matthew 15, 7 through 9, he wrote, in vain do they worship me. Are you worshiping God in vain? Oh, yes. Are you worshiping God in vain? God desire worship, but they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
When we look at Isaiah 29, 13, we can only identify three elements of the worship that made it vain. And I want to close with these three elements. The first element that made this worship in vain, they honor him with lip service. We have folks. You wonder why, amen, Jeremiah had to wear that linen girdle, why it became dirty and marred. That, that's like then, it's like now. We have people that honor him with lip service. It is possible to repeat words in worship to God without practicing the meaning. Once again, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. So the same thing. It's possible to repeat words of worship to God without practicing or participating in its true meaning. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. So once again, it's possible to repeat words of worship without practicing or participating in their meaning. Perhaps you have occasionally found yourself in church singing songs and hymns, singing every word clearly, even enjoying the song and the praise and worship only to realize that you were not taking note of the words that was coming out of your mouth, mm. but thinking of something else. Oh, no, 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 no. This makes you feel rather foolish before God. Yes, because you have been singing and worshiping to him by inscription, by tradition, by doctrine, without thinking about what you were singing. Imagine if you worship like, if you worship like that all the time, how vain that worship would be. And so we see here, mm -hmm. the lip service means saying yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Lip service is saying yes with your mouth, but saying no in your heart. Oh, my my And you can't say amen, just say ouch. With my whole heart, I'll agree, and my answer will be yes. Lord, yes. Is it honoring God with your lips when your heart is far from him? Meaning and believing what we say. Words uttered by the mouth. However true, do not impress God. I'm going to say again. Words uttered by the mouth. However in true, do not impress God if the speaker is not taking account of their meaning. Some religions have forms of words that are considered to have power in themselves. But true religion is taking account of the words that God means and believing it. Imagine reciting the Apostle Creed or similar when you do not believe half of what you're saying. Mm. We believe the Bible to be the only infallible written word of God. We believe that there's only one God, eternally existence of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy. Oh, we can get up and quote. We can get up and quote these things. We can recite them. Amen. But do they have any meaning? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, let thy will be done. We can get up and recite these things. But when you do not believe there is a real father in heaven, even we got these so-called prophets, preachers, bishops, whatever, have been known to do these things. They got some good homiletics. Put their hand behind the ear and rear up and make folks go hysterical. I can't get nobody help me. The second thing, amen, praise the Lord. I said there was three things. The second one is, uh-huh, praise the Lord. You remember I told you I want to identify three elements of worship that are made vain? The first one was honoring him with the lips. The second one, we have removed our hearts far from him. The secret of true worship is that we worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4 and 24. Not only must things we say and feel be true, but they must be the love of our spirit, our heart deep desire. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, Many people worship with arterial motives. Oh, no, I didn't say that, did I? Yes, they did. Amen. They worship. You ever been to a service where the preacher preached real good, and after you get finished preaching, 
Amen. He called for an offering after one had already been taken. I call that pimping the church. That's what I call it. And that's what I call it. I call it pimping the church. He gets you all hysterical, all up, up in all height. And then he called for an offering. I call that pimping the church. That's not going to happen at Be Your Holy. No, no, not here. Amen. And so not only must the things we say and feel be true, but they must be the love of our spirit, our deep heart, our heart deep desire. Unfortunately, many people worship them, worship from arterial motives. And the desires of the heart are far from God. The example is in Matthew 6, 2 through 7, 16 through 18. Some seek their own glory and praise. I mean, we have some dynamic preachers. We got some dynamic teachers. But what is a turnoff for me while I'm in these services? They have already taken up the offering. Amen. And I'm sorry, I learned from Dad Cook, Pastor Cook. He taught us from Corinthians that before evangelists even come to town, I already had the money set aside. So the evangelist, has, he had to do is just focus on preaching the gospel. And so I have a problem with, after the offering been taken up, the preacher is preaching a dynamic message, a good word, and then he get tainted, somebody shout tainted, by the filthy lucre. Want to raise another offering, pimping God's people. Y'all don't like me? That's okay, I'll be all right. Amen. Self-glory seekers. Money. Some seek wealth and earthly prosperity. They seem to be serving God, but they do so because they think God will make them rich on earth. Some go into pastoral ship. I know I'm about to meddle now. Some go into pastoring just for an offering, just for the money. They don't care nothing about the soul. And I said it before, I say it again. Those are not pastors. They are hirelings. Mm -hmm. They are only there because you're paying them. Amen. These, this is not true Christianity. I don't like me up in here. I'm going to say again. This is not true Christianity. Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for thyself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, uh-huh, there where your heart be also. Do you have the heart of the people at mind? When you give and try to pimp them for my money, I can't get nobody to help me. And then the other problem I have, that's why Jeremiah is wearing that girdle. You said God called you to pastor. God called you to go, amen, to quit your job and pastor. But yet and still, you want to give and, and brown beat the people for more money. I can't get nobody to help me. I got a problem. The girl is marred. Amen. And then another example is our own invention. Some love and follow their own tradition rather than the word of God. As we noticed earlier, this was a particular problem that Jesus was referring to when he quoted Isaiah, in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrine the commandments of men. So we will take this example in a moment as the last major point of this message. But when our hearts are centered on things like those that I just listed above, self-glory, money, own intervention, then our hearts are far from God and we worship the Lord in vain. The third one, and this is why I'm closing. Get off me, Sister Wright. Amen. Praise the Lord. The third one, as I mentioned, if your worship are, is like all, that all times, amen, praise the Lord. And so like I said, amen, I want to identify three elements of worship that made vain. The third one is the reverence human tradition. As we said before, there are those who love and follow their own tradition rather than the word of God. When they do this, their worship and service in vain. It is in vain, and by the sense of the word, vain becomes its presumptuous. People who think they should replace the word of God with their own invention and traditions are suffering from vanity and pride. I don't know why folks want to go out and write their own Bible now. Y'all don't like me up in here. I'm not going to mention no names, but I got a problem. Folks want to go write, write their own Bible. What's wrong with God's Bible? I just need to know. 
and then y'all go out and get these study Bibles. Ah, no, 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 those shundo. Y'all might not like me up in here. And we can't hear God because we hear Thompson Chain. We can't hear God because we hear Matthew Henry. We, we hear dates. We can't hear God. We hear what man said and not what God said. Y'all don't like me up in here. The first seven years of my life getting saved, when I got saved, the first seven years, God forbid me to buy any reference Bible. And the same type of Bible I have today is the same type of Bible I got I had when I got saved 38 years ago. God forbid me to buy any Bible that got reference or people stopped on the side. He said, Adoshando, Hadoshi. Well, he was teaching me to get an ear to hear from him. I can't get nobody to help me. But now we rely on man and not on God. Them that have ears, let me hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Vain because it is empty. Men are not able to invent a religion of any substance. Religion must come from God, not from the devising of humanity. And so as I close on today, have you forgotten what you look like? Or you forgot, have you forgotten who you are, whose you are? Have you become marred? Amen, praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace right now. Lord, we come repenting and asking you to forgive us, Lord. Because we can admit that even in vain, we have worshipped you, God. We worshipped you when we didn't really feel like it and, and we had an attitude. We didn't want to worship you. But we did it because we didn't want nobody to notice us, Lord. And so, God, we come before you asking you to forgive us for our vain worship. Lord, forgive us right now and create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us in the name of Jesus. And so I'm asking you now, Lord, God, have your way right now in the name of Jesus. So, oh, God, right now, transform my heart, transform my mind, transform my soul. In the name of Jesus. Lord, as we sang growing up in vacation, Bible school, oh Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. I want to be more loving in my heart. I want to be more like you in my heart. I don't want to be like this girl, oh God, that became marred. And you don't want to have nothing to do with this marred girdle. God, I'm asking that you wash us over again. Wash us from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet, God. Wash all the stench, the smell of sin off of me, God. Wash me whiter than snow, God. Cleanse me with hyssop, Lord. Purge me with hyssop, Lord. In the name of Jesus, that I be that son you're calling for, that we be the sons and daughters you're calling for in the last and evil days. In Jesus' name we pray. Can we all say amen, amen, and amen. Thank you for attending this awesome service. The women of Be Ye Holy Ministries are hosting our Breaking Free Revival, featuring Evangelist Frazier of Topeka, Kansas, from 24 June to 26 June at 7.30 p.m. nightly, culminating on 28 June at 11.30 a.m. Please join us via Facebook or YouTube be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and select the bell symbol so you'll be notified when we go live. Again, on behalf of Pastor Joe L. Newsom and First Lady Annette Newsom, thank you for attending. Come fellowship with us again and may God bless you.